Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. And uh, I'd like also to thank uh, Matty Bunzel. I don't know if he's here. Uh, <laughs> uh, for inviting me to, to speak at the Chicago Humanities Festival. It's uh, an incredible honor uh, to be listed among uh, some of the luminaries who uh, are, are speaking this year and, and in the past. And it's really inc incredibly flattering to be included. Um, and uh, it's also great as the director of the Humanities Institute at Ohio State to be partnering with the festival for, I think, the third, that this is the third year we've, we've done this. Um, okay. So I'm gonna talk about uh, ba Bambi, <clears throat> but I'm gonna start with Boober uh, and work my way to, to Bambi. And I'm gonna read and talk, uh, it'll be a mix of of, of reading from a, a prepared text and speaking extemporaneously. I hope that's agreeable. Um, in any case, uh, on January 20th, 1909, the Bar Kokhba Association in Prague launched an ambitious program of festive evenings, one that would have the organizers hoped an immediate impact. They had reason to think that they would be successful in this. Martin Buber would be their first featured speaker and his cultural Zionism had been generating a great deal of excitement in their circle. Buber's emphasis on education and inner self-development, together with his call for the recovery of subterranean Jewish forces and sensibilities, and his promise that this spiritual renewal would equip Western Jews to have a key part in a larger cosmopolitan project of rebirth, all resonated powerfully with the young German Jewish intellectuals who had taken over Bar Kokhba's leadership. Indeed, in addition to paying tribute to Buber again and again, they kept inviting him back. It was as their guest that Buber held all the addresses in his celebrated volume, Three Speeches on Judaism, and it was enthusiasm like theirs that eventually led Gershom Sholem, who went through his own adolescent infatuation with Buber, to remark on the excesses of Buberty. <laughs> if landing Buber was a coup, Leo Hermann, the man in charge of setting up Bar Kokhba's initial festive evening hadn't done as well with his other invitations, or so it must have seemed. Herman wanted to pair Buber with a different kind of Jewish author, with someone who would broaden the appeal of the event. But his first choice for that role, the novelist Arthur Schnitzler, turned him down. His second choice, the poet Richard Bier Hoffmann, did too. So Herman went with Plan C, Felix Zalten, a friend of Bo Schnitzler and Beer Hoffman. Like those friends, Zalten had been a member of the Young Vienna Circle of Writers in the 1890s. Unlike them, however, he hadn't produced major works, let alone ones that artfully engage with Jewish themes, as, for example, Schnitzler's novel, The Road into the Open, does. In 1909, Dalton was known mostly for his wide-ranging activities as a newspaper critic, as a cultivator of connections to the Habsburg family, the great satirist Karl Krauss once described him as a court journalist, and for being the author of the pornographic fictional memoir, Josefina Mutzenbacher. <clears throat> Published anonymously, but immediately attributed to Zalton, the book relates in vivid detail the story of a prostitute who has, and it's this is her speaking now, I'm quoting, experienced everything a woman can experience in beds, in bed, on tables, chairs, benches, lying in the grass, in hallways. The sentence goes on for a long time like this. <laughs> and who claims to regret none of it. <clears throat> Hermann, of course, turned to Zalton for other reasons. At 39, 39 there, amazingly, it looks, very mature to be a 39-year-old, but things were different back then. Um, Hermann, Hermann, of course, turned to Zalton for other reasons. At 39, Zalton was as fit, he was a devoted hiker and cyclist, and as lively as ever. And he could be a charismatic, even beguiling presence. Rilke, who wasn't quick to praise, effused over the charm and energy of Zalton's conversation. After attending one of Zalton's lectures, Kafka noted the pleasure the young, that of the young female auditors, including his sister, had been palpable. 
Zalton was, moreover, intriguing as a Zionist. Of the young Vienna authors, he alone mobilized his pen in support of Theodor Herzl's Zionist newspaper, The World. During its first year, Zalton had a regular column. In fact, inspired by Herzl's message of self-acceptance, or really of self-improvement through self-acceptance, Zalton became an effective critic of the attempt to hide or disown Jewish heritage. He was also concerned about the menace of anti-Semitism. Zalton grew up poor and feeling unprotected. And in his column, he addressed the vulnerability of Eastern Jews living in destitution, as well as the anti-Jewish utterances of demagogues like Karl Lueger and Georg von Schönerer. Zalton actually never finished high school. Um, and sometimes certain grammatical infelicities would enter into his prose and this Krauss that I've written about, who didn't like Salton very much, would delight in pointing out these grammatical mistakes Salton would make, and Krauss would connect this to Salton's lack of formal education, and Salton would, uh, or at least on one occasion, attacked Krauss on the street for this, um, boxing his ear, the ear fig, as the Germans say, or feige. Um, these were, you know, this was a time of real literary rivalries. Um, things are. I guess, calmer in the world of letters most of the time today. Um, <clears throat> and Salton was also, uh, as a, a child, uh, going to a gymnasium in, in, in Vienna, um, being one of the poor students in this gymnasium where there was some anti-Semitism. He was evidently uh, the victim of anti-Semitic uh, discrimination on the part of a couple of teachers. And this is something that, that stayed with him and. Uh, made him uh, open, perhaps more open than some of his uh, friends to supporting Zionism. Um, Bear Hoffmann, Hoffmannsthal, Schnitzler, these Jewish members of the young Vienna uh, writer circle, they all grew up wealthy and feeling, as a, res as a result of that, um, more protected. Uh, who your father was, you know, mattered uh, when it came to the kinds of the acts of discrimination that that Zalton was uh, affected by. And uh, Schnitzler's father was the doctor to the emperor's mistress. Nobody was going to mess uh, with, with Schnitzler lightly. Um, people knew this. Uh, Zalton didn't have any, any such backup. Um, and as a result, again, he was more affected by anti-Semitism. Um, but above all, it was culture that interested Zalton. His most substantial, most searching essay for the world, this Zionist newspaper, underlines the importance of theater for Jewry's self-awareness. His profile of Herzl, which he composed just after Herzl's death in 1904, treats the project of political Zionism as the culmination of Herzl's efforts as a playwright rather than as a departure from them, as the fifth act that Herzl plotted out for the drama of his own life. Having consulted with Buber, Zalton brought together his various tendencies as a Zionist commentator in a speech he gave on January 20th. The combination proved to be a winning one. Both the Zionists and the non-Zionists in attendance responded to it with clamorous approval. As the applause for Zalton thundered on, Buber, who had worried that following him would be hard, was left wondering how, under such circumstances, he would manage to connect with the public. Reviews of the event suggest that Buber's lecture didn't, in fact, go over as well. Hence one scholar's conclusion that the evening was successful mostly because Zalton gave a brilliant performance. The years before the First World War marked the high point of Zalton's career as a Zionist speaker. Zalton, too, was invited back by Bar Kokhba's leaders. And when, in 1911, he made another, he made another appearance in the festive evening series, he shone just as brightly as he had the first time while addressing similar themes. But even after lecturing in a Zionist key was for the most part behind him, Zalton continued to write from a Zionist perspective. He traveled to Palestine in 1924, for example, and published a largely admiring book about the Jewish settlements he encountered there. This was soon after Zalton had produced the work that would win him uh, international fame, Bambi which first appeared in serialized form in Vienna's stately paper record, the Neue Freie Presse. The book version came out the following year, or in 1923, and by then the story had established itself uh, as one that appealed 
to adults and children alike. The American edition was so hotly anticipated that the fledgling Book of the Month Club ordered 50,000 copies before the translation had even appeared. Translated into English by Whitaker Chambers, of all people, and published in the US in 1928, the novel was both a critical and a commercial success. One American reviewer deemed it to be as profoundly pertinent to the modern experience as the Magic Mountain, and it impressed more than a few influential readers. Among these was the producer and director, Sidney Franklin, who bought the rights to the film in 1933, or the film rights to Bambi, excuse me, in 1933 for $1,000. His plan was to adapt the book uh, to the screen as a live nature film, but he couldn't figure out how to make such a version work. He eventually sold the rights to Walt Disney, who, with his visceral dislike of hunting, had been genuinely moved by Zalton's novel. Of course, that didn't stop Disney from transforming the story Bambi tells. Captiousness, melancholy, and a sentimental streak, <clears throat> excuse me, captiousness, melancholy, and a sentimental streak count among the prominent characteristics of Zalton's animals. The animals in Disney's film, which premiered in 1942, are altogether more frolicsome, brash, and affable. The plucky rabbit Thumper, for example, in Dis is Disney's creation, not Zalton's. More than in the book, in the film, the forest, while no Eden, has an initial tranquility that is shattered by the cruelty of man. Indeed, some viewers regarded the film as registering the trauma of the attack on Pearl Harbor and the loss of America's innocence. Zalton, nevertheless, commented positively on the film, though he always referred to it as Disney's Bambi. In 1940, what distressed him were the terms of his contract with Disney. Uh, in 1941, Zalton, whose works had long been banned in, Germ in Germany and who was, as a result of that, in economic distress, complained, I have been delivered over to Disney with my hands and feet fettered and a gag in my mouth. Zalton's heirs would fare no better. In 1996, a senior district judge in California wrote that Bambi <coughs> wrote, and this is a quotation, Bambi learned very early in life that the meadow was full of potential dangers everywhere he turned. Unfortunately, Bambi's creator, Mr. Zalton, could not know of the equally dangerous conditions lurking in the world of copyright protection. That's the judge in 1996. <coughs> Despite the fact that Zalton's Bambi appeared just before his book about Palestine was published, critics have hardly ever tried to put the novel into conversation with his Zionism. They have spent much more energy tracking the affinities between Bambi and Josefina Mutzenbacher, beginning with the mockers who ridiculed the sensual moments in the former book as the work of a dear sodomite. Uh, <clears throat> this was fairly scurrilous stuff. Uh, these were... Uh, anti-Semitic critics of, of Zalton uh, making these kinds of claims about the connections between his erotic literature and his nature stories. Um, but this isn't to suggest that critics have spent much energy on Zalton. He is something like Max Brod, principally known for the people he knew. Because of Zalton's role in important literary networks, as well as his enormous output, his name comes up a lot, but even his own friends, Schnitzler, and Hugo von Hofmannsthal had their doubts about the seriousness of his literary efforts. If the scholarly discussion of Zalton's works were larger, it is likely that we would have detailed interpretations of Zalton's animal stories as allegories of Jewish experience. For as is the case with Kafka's animal stories, they lend themselves to such readings, even if Zalton didn't play as much or as artfully with the longstanding associations in German culture between Jews and certain animals, like mice and monkeys. Um, <clears throat> consider The Hound of Florence, which uh, also came out in 1923, another work by Zalton that has, a, that has had an afterlife in American popular culture. It was, and was formally credited as being, the inspiration for Disney's The Shaggy Dog film franchise. This semi-autobiographical novel deals in, among other things, the theme of the outsider as abject insider. The Hound of Florence tells the story of an artist who must spend every other day in aristocratic society as a dog. And remember, Zalton was known for cultivating 
connections with aristocrats, with the Habsburg family. And this is why Krauss mocked him as a, a court journalist. And so he seems here to be expressing something about his relationship with these uh, aristocrats, that he had a kind of intimacy, but he was not on equal footing with them by a long shot. Much more central to the animal stories, however, is the theme of persecution. It was Krauss who first linked this element to Salton's Jewish background, though not in the way you might expect, given that Krauss did this just after the Nazi party had achieved mainstream success. Writing about a Bambi spin-off in 1930, Krauss claimed to detect the sound of Jewish dialect, or yudel, in the speech of Zalton's hares. Zalton was a hunter, a humane one, he always insisted, and as it happened, he had just published a piece about his love of hunting. Krauss joked that Zalton's hares had adopted a yiddish -y tone of voice in order to blend in with a special type of enemy, the Jewish hunter. The hares were, and this is Krauss, perhaps using mimicry as a defense against persecution. When Zalton died in 1945, an American critic found a more straightforward connection between the plight of some animal characters and that of the Jews. In his obituary for Zalton, the critic, having noted Zalton's Zionist sentiments, maintained that the fox in Bambi not only comes across as the rapacious Hitler of the forest, but also as a mentality of hatred and rage that bears similarities with Goebbels' anti-Semitism. It was not until a decade ago, however, that an actual reading of the Zionist overtones in Bambi was proposed. In an essay published in 2003, Iris Bruce argued <clears throat> that the novel evokes the experience of exclusion and discrimination. And she also noted how uh, Zalton's language in the book is uh, uh, evocative of the Jewish experience. Um, his suggestive phrase in Bambi for butterflies is wandering flowers uh, who have to keep moving because the best spots have already been taken. Bruce stressed as well that the culture of the deer develops around the fact of their victimization. They tell their children tales that are always full of horror and misery. Likening Bambi to Kafka's Talking Ape story, a report to an academy, Bruce argues that Zalton's work, too, is a critique of assimilation. Oh, I meant to put up the uh, an illustration from the original Bambi, and that's from the film. I meant to put that up a little while ago, sorry. Um, uh, <coughs> likening Bambi to, uh, uh, to Kafka's Talking Ape story, a report to an academy, Bruce argues that Zalton works, too, is a critique of assimilation. One of the deer uses the loaded verb verfolgen to ask whether humans and deer might get along. Her query reads, will they ever stop persecuting us? That's what verfolgen means in German, and it was the standard way to talk about the persecution of the Jews and other groups. Um, will they ever stop persecuting, persecuting us? When another deer answers that reconciliation with humans will eventually come about, old Netla, a third deer with vastly more experience of the world, will have none of it. Indeed, her response foreshadows a line from Zalton's <coughs> Zionist book, New People on Ancient Ground, which expresses impatience with the enduring dream of full integration. Old Netla sees that humans have, and now I'm quoting her, uh, that humans have given us no peace and have murdered us for as long as we've existed. So why should we think that one day they'll act otherwise? Not many deer in the story persist in believing that living harmoniously among humans is possible. Of the deer that do, two wind up being killed by hunters. One of those deer, Bambi's cousin Gobo, spends time in captivity, and when he returns to the forest boasting of how well he was treated, Bambi is taken aback by how strange and blind Bobo has become, Gobo has become. Furthermore, where Gobo is proud of the band that humans have placed around his neck, which should have made him off limits to persecution, marking him as, as tame, the wise royal leader of the deer regards it and Gobo's attitude toward it as signs of degradation. Upon hearing Gobo speak of the band as the greatest honor, the royal leader, leader labels Gobo an unfortunate child. That Gobo's faith in humankind leads to his death reinforces the royal leader's assessment. The, la the, the label royal leader, on the other hand, reinforces the old deer's status as a Herzl figure, 
since at the time Herzl was often given regal titles in Zionist discourse. As Bruce puts it, the old prince of the forest then can be said to represent Herzl. That formulation may be a bit much. As we shall see, Zalton's Zionist background isn't the only key to understanding what Bambi is really about, and, as Bruce, her as, and, and Bruce herself allows this. But in the end, Bruce's essay provides enough support to make its conclusion seem plausible. And this is her conclusion. Bambi has Zionist overtones because the critique of assimilation and the longing for a new Herzl figure are prominent themes. We could, however, cite quite a bit of additional evidence to underpin this claim, especially the part about the critique of assimilation. For example, Bruce might have mentioned the memorable scene when one of the hunter's dogs chases down the fox who has been shot. Even the fox's prey stick up for him, accusing the dog of a self-betrayal that can't be compared to the fox's natural cruelty. Also worth noting is another scene that didn't make it into the film. The royal leader, who turns out to be Bambi's father, takes Bambi to see a slain poacher. As the two of them stand over the dead body, the royal leader encourages Bambi to draw the lesson that he shouldn't see his oppressors as almighty or himself as inferior to them. Then there is the fact that the most assimilationist of the deer is, as well, the weakest of them, both physically and mentally. Indeed, what brings Gobo together with humans is his frailty and lack of resolve. While trying to escape from a group of hunters, he gives up, allowing himself to collapse and the hunters to take pity on him, at least for a while. By contrast, one of the king's notable properties is endurance in flight. And another of his main teachings is that in order to survive, you will likely have to exceed what you take to be the limit of your capacities. He impresses upon Bambi that you can and must keep going and going, even when the hunters who are chasing you have put a bullet in your back. And there's a scene, uh, a kind of drawn out scene in the book where Bambi has been shot and he thinks, you know, he's basically going to die and his father appears and takes him to a safe place, but it's a long journey to a safe place, and Bambi keeps saying, I can't, I can't go any further, you know, I'm, I'm, just let me rest. Um, and uh, his father says, no, you have to keep going, you owe it to yourself, to the dear folk, to keep going, and Bambi, of course, does keep going and manages to survive. This is in stark contrast to Gobo's behavior in the face of persecution, which is basically to lie down and, uh, and beg for, for mercy, hope for mercy. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a little cold. I have to keep drinking here. If you want, it is no fairy tale. Thus reads the epigraph that introduces Old New Land, Herzl's utopian novel of a Jew's state. Zalton might have used the line, it is no fairy tale, despite what you want, at the beginning of Bambi. Like a lot of other early Zionists, Zalton wanted to see Jews settle in Palestine, but he couldn't imagine leaving Central Europe himself. And this is particularly true of cultural Zionists, one of the significant distinctions between cultural Zionism and, uh, and political Zionism. Cultural Zionists who emphasized the importance of a kind of inner rebirth, they thought that this could happen in other countries. And yes, it would be nice for Jews to have a safe place, um, <clears throat> but uh, the key thing, again, was this inner spiritual renewal, which could be done anywhere, and it's no coincidence that the best known cultural Zionists, Buber and uh, Max Brot, didn't leave Europe, Central Europe, until basically the, you know, the last moment possible. Um, whereas, I mean, there were a lot of political Zionists who stayed around for a long time as well. Um, so it's kind of a complicated question, as with many aspects of Zionism. Um, but both Buber and, and uh, uh, Broad left, I believe, in 30, late in 38, and that's, that's significant. Um, so, uh, like a lot of other early Zionists, Zalton wanted to see Jews settle in Palestine, but he couldn't imagine leaving Central Europe himself. Part of the reason why was the landscape. Zalton regarded himself as a true lover of Austria's forests, who was well acquainted with and could even find beauty in their darker sides. 
With Bambi, Zaltan wanted to disabuse members of the then popular back to nature movement of idealizations that evidently annoyed him. Most nature enthusiasts were, according to him, familiar only with the lifeless forest, with the forest without animals. These friends of nature were, in truth, strangers to nature, and especially to its harshness. And this strangers to nature formulation is, uh, is from, from Zaltan. Zaltan, of course, uh, being a known hunter uh, and a lover of nature and animals, uh, uh, took some heat for what seemed to some people to be a contradiction. Zaltan defended himself saying that uh, it was uh, hunting that taught him really to appreciate nature and all its multifariousness because most so-called friends of nature only enjoyed nature when you know, the weather was nice and stayed on the, the beaten path. Zaltan, the hunter, would go out in all kinds of weather and, and lie in still for hours and hours waiting for his prey. He also claimed that uh, of the 200 deer he killed, uh, uh, most were killed with clean shots. He, there, were only, there were only two uh, that he had to go and you know, they were lying there gasping or whatever and he had to go and uh, uh, put out of their misery. And he, uh, he was a critic of what he took to be inhumane hunting practices. Uh, uh, Franz Ferdinand was a very enthusiastic hunter and uh, he would uh, kill you know, hundreds of animals in a, an afternoon hunting session. He would have animals in a hunting preserve herded along a narrow path and there he would be waiting you know, with his gun and his friends and they would commit a mini genocide and uh, Zaltan was uh, he was critical of this kind of practice. So he, he saw no contradiction between his, uh, his love of hunting and his love of animals who he thought were, were capable of deep cognition. Um, and he didn't seem to mind when uh, Bambi was understood to be a, an anti-hunting uh, book. So Bambi sets the record straight about nature. This is another thing that it's clearly trying to do um, by emphasizing the inevitability of violence and privation in its sylvan setting. Even without the hunters, the woods would be a dangerous, difficult place for most animals. Their homeland could never be a land of milk and honey. Yet precisely because of the omnipresence of danger in Bambi, the importance of a safe space, a major theme in, Zion, in the Zionist literature of the period, is foregrounded everywhere. Indeed, the royal leader never seems more like a metaphor for a Zionist savior than when he leads Bambi to that rarest of things in the forest, a secure mini territory where Bambi, whom hunters have injured, can at last rest and regenerate properly. Piling up examples like these has its merits, but it isn't the only way, or I think the most productive way to understand Bambi. Zalton Zionism, or the Zionist echoes in Bambi. Zalton Zionism consisted, as we have heard, of more than a broad critique of assimilation and his veneration of Herzl. Zalton had other Zionist concerns too, and taking them into account as we read or reread Bambi helps us to make sense of the book's more, some of the book's more enigmatic and resonant moments. And I'm getting sort of close to the end, and, and I'll remind you that we have time for questions. So if you are thinking about questions, this would be a good time to start formulating them in your, in your heads, even as you, of course, continue to listen attentively <laughs> to this talk. Um, <clears throat> I am thinking, above all, of Bambi's encounters with the elk. It turns out that Bambi's father isn't the only royalty in the forest. All the male deer enjoy the status of princes, Princen is Zaltan's word, but the elk, Bambi's towering relatives, are referred to as kings. Even more than his father, these majestic animals intimidate Bambi. Around them, he feels not simply small, but also diminished. Confronted with their looming regality, Bambi becomes ashamed of the diffidence of his community. The elk seem like mighty deer that haven't been cowed by persecution and its, and its attendant anxieties. Bambi's response is to try to think of himself as their equal and to attempt to connect with them. 
but he is too awed to reach either goal. He winds up seeing himself as nothing by comparison, and he's unable to bring himself to strike up a conversation with one of the elk, which further undermines his sense of self, and which, from the perspective of the elk, is too bad. As Bambi chides himself, the elk casually wonders why deer and elk speak to each other so rarely. Bambi, for instance, appears to be such a charming fellow. This is the elk's formulation for Bambi. This drawn-out communicative failure has its counterpart and complement in Bambi's experience of the elk's mating calls, which the novel presents as the kind of aesthetic experience, or as, as a kind of aesthetic experience, or rather as the kind of aesthetic experience that Zalton, the cultural Zionist, wanted to see. Like other cultural Zionists, including Buber, Zalton thought that Western Jewry had fallen into an unfortunate cycle. Deracination had made real creativity hard to come by, and real creativity in the aesthetic sphere was both a primary end in itself and the way to greater self-consciousness and spiritual renewal. Artistically formed, as Zalton once put it, was how objective Judaism could be made perceptible. And this, of course, was necessary for Jewish self-consciousness. Where Buber believed that Western Jews could find crucial knowledge and inspiration in the mystical folk culture of Eastern Jewry, Zalton envisioned a progression that would take Jews from the tear-filled Zionist dramas of the present to the liberating artistic expressions of or power that are to, liberate, uh, uh, to the liberating artistic expressions of or power that are rooted in the consciousness of the free person, and to the mother sounds, and these are quotations from Zalton, mother sounds or power, uh, that, uh, and to the mother sounds that are as primordial as those in the books of Job and Solomon. In the meantime, though, you could find a taste of the elemental in Jewish culture in the raging work of Heinrich Eisenbach, an actor whose physical comedy repertoire included a popular imitation of ape movements. There was something about animals and art for Zalton and Zionism or, and, and Jewish self-consciousness forms a very interesting triangle. Suggestively enough, Zalton employs the key terms from his cultural Zionist writings to evoke the sounds with which the elk, those undaunted kings of the forest, call for renewal. As Bambi listens to the elemental tones of a noble, unsettled blood raging with ore power in its longing, anger, and pride, and this is a quotation from Bambi, he is transfixed. Regular conversation with the elk may not quite work yet, but their song affects him profoundly. Bambi can think of nothing else until it stops, and it makes him afraid, in part perhaps because of the stirring it induces in his deepest mental faculties. Yet as Bambi takes in his relative's expression of this ore power, he feels something else too, pride. And this is again Zalton's term. Um, so in the end, you know, I'm, I kind of go, uh, I'm of two minds about the novel. I think that there are some fascinating parts of it and there's, uh, as other people have pointed out, really a very moving and, and deep uh, uh, discussion between two leaves that are about to fall off a tree in the autumn about mortality um, and the, the evanescence of beauty. And one leaf says, you know, look, I, I must look horrible. And the other leaf says, oh, my dear, you're as beautiful as always. Um, and uh, I'm not doing justice to it now. Um, but if I were, you would, I, I, it would, it would, uh, uh, it would conv convey uh, something of the, the, the depth of the book. Um, other times, the book is, uh, uh, sentimental uh, schmaltzy, um, which facilitated uh, its integration into American culture as kitsch, basically, through Disney. Um, but, and this is obviously the point that I've been trying to make, the roots of the book, uh, they go uh, far back uh, in Zalton's career uh, uh, to this night of January 20th, 1909, and his Zionist speech making and beyond actually as well because he began as a Zionist somewhat earlier than that as well. Um, so this, this is what I, I have on, on, on Bambi. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Michael has generously agreed to come back and serve as a moderator. And uh, uh, 
I, oh, I should say one other thing. Um, if, if you have a question, just signal to the microphone bearers that you have a, uh, a question, and they'll come around. I think we all agree that we've just been treated to an illuminating and insightful treatment uh, of the book. I, for one, am in total agreement with everything I, I heard <laughs> and, uh, and learned a lot and felt that it really gave the sense of um, even the profundity uh, of this book, which in many ways I would suggest was ruined um, for an American, beyond American population by the Disney treatment. It is something much, much more than that, as we just heard. Um, again, there are people with microphones. If you want to ask a question, please wait till the microphone is with you um, because this is all being taped, recorded, and they want to make sure to get it that way. And I maybe yeah, stand I, up so we okay. can see you and I can call on people and make sure that everybody who yeah. wants to ask okay. gets a chance. Okay, I have two questions, but I think they're both real short. Um, one is, what did he do with those 200 deer after he shot them? And how was the book received by the Ostjuden, the Eastern Jews who were poor and wandering around? And um, I assume the book was, was translated into Yiddish at some point. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, that's an interesting question um, and something that I should look up, um, the, the history of Bambi in Yiddish, whether it was, it was translated into Yiddish. Uh, um, Salden, uh, by the way, uh, if I might just pick up on this, this Yiddish uh, issue, it does, doesn't answer your question, but it might anticipate a, a question. The, the, the rabbits uh, that Krauss Zalton's nemesis uh, uh, identified as speaking in a kind of Yiddish -y tone. Zalton didn't totally disagree, didn't, didn't disagree with this. Uh, and there's, uh, he, he may well have ac actually intended to give uh, their dialogue a sort of Yiddish -y feel, uh, uh, the rhythms of their, their speech. Um, I don't know uh, the, uh, but you know, to come back to the, the question that you actually asked, I don't know uh, the history of Bambi and Yiddish. I, I, I'm not sure what uh, Eastern Jews um, said about it. Most of the critics who linked it with persecution were, uh, were Jews. Um, I haven't seen that much of that being done. I've, I've seen references it to, to it being done a lot. People say that it's been done a lot, but then when you actually try to look to see how often it's been done, it, it, you, know, you can do very nice searches of uh, German Jewish newspapers and it's the kind of thing where people would be discussing Bambi in this way and you don't really, you don't really find anything. With the, uh, the deer, um, I don't know what he did. Uh, I'm really kind of here coming up uh, blank here, um, what did he do with the deer? Um, I imagine that he had, he had trophies, he had uh, antlers, you know, hanging on his wall. Um, he liked to go around in, in hunting attire. I mean, he very much identified with Austrian hunting culture, and he, did, he, he wrote for hunting magazines. Um, but again, he saw uh, as Many of, is the case, you know, with lots of hunters, no contradiction between being an animal lover and a hunter. Uh, he thought that he was out there communing with them in a special way and that it was only by observing animals as a hunter uh, that he got to know them so well and that he was able to appreciate them as well uh, as he eventually managed to and, and that this appreciation uh, was what allowed him to write Bambi. So he said, more than once, without my hunting, there would be no Bambi. Another question? Was the name of the original book Bambi, and what does it signify? Uh, yes, it was Bambi. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, a, a play on Bambino. Bambi's a little baby at the beginning. Um, uh, David Rakoff, uh, I, maybe some of you have seen that there is a link uh, to an article by David Rakoff on uh, the website for this talk. Um, and uh, the, the very 
brilliant essayist who unfortunately died a couple of years ago at a young age. Uh, and he has a, a piece in Tablet magazine on uh, Bambi uh, where he points out uh, the irony of uh, Bambi being now uh, mostly a female, uh, a name that's attached to, to, to women. Um, although for, for Salton it was, you know, Bambi is, is, is obviously male. And then Rakoff kind of works around to this sort of arch observation that it's also in a way fitting that uh, Bambi would be, the name Bambi would be used as it is for women because it's very often used for women in pornographic films. And Zalton was, of course, a pornographer in a way. And so <laughs> that's his point, not mine. Next question. Um, was he married? Did he have children of his own? Uh, yes, he, uh, he married. Uh, he was a, uh, something of a Lothario um, for quite a while. Uh, he had many mistresses, uh, and, uh, and then he finally settled down um, and married an, an actress uh, whom he was devoted to. It was evidently a pretty, pretty happy marriage. Um, and he had two children, uh, and they, for quite a while, uh, had a nice domestic life. He, he rented a ramshackle house on the outskirts of town that had lots of animals. Some were actual pets, and others were just animals that were living in the house. Um, and uh, you know, he really, he really liked nature. Um, he had a, you know, he he had uh, his his ups and downs in life. He never really, never really, even though he was quite successful in his way, uh, and and incredibly prolific and and, and hardworking. In fact. He was, for a time, uh, he took over the editorship of the Berliner Morgenpost, a newspaper in Berlin. And, you know, the Berliners tended to think of the Viennese as, as lazy, um, <clears throat> kind of southern European, indolent, you know, characters. And uh, Zalt, so when Zalton arrived as the new editor, they were expecting things to get easier, and, and they were stunned by Zalton's whip-cracking ways as a boss. And he insisted that, no, you should not, you know, go home from the theater and then get up in the morning and write your review, you should write your review directly after the theater, you know, come back to the office after the theater, write the review, and then, you know, if there's time, you go home and sleep, and if not, you know, the new day begins. Um, so he was, uh, he, he was hardworking and, and success, successful, but uh, he never, and at times, he did okay financially. He actually made a couple of movies as a director. Um, <clears throat> he had his, you know, fingers in many pots, um, but he never really got the respect that he wanted. And his friends, who were more famous and, and uh, uh, regarded as the authors of really, you know, high-level literature, they, as I mentioned, they kind of looked at his work a little bit askance. And if you read his correspondence with Schnitzler and Hoffmannsthal, it's kind of sad. Zalton gives them his work to read, and he obviously really wants praise. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And they, you know, they're good writers, and they know how to you know, formulate things carefully. And without outright lying to their, you know, to the to the friend, they, you know, suggest, oh, it's very good. Um, I'm kind of glad I didn't write this myself. You know, there's like there's always something in there, something kind of withholding um, as they're praising. And his son died. Uh, in his 30s, and this was a, he was very close to his, both his children, and this was, of course, a, a very devastating thing for him, just a kind of a, some microphone. Brain, microphone. brain infection. Somebody with Sorry, a I'm going on at too great length. Yes, more questions. Somebody with a mic, able to, oh, you have somebody there, and meanwhile, I have a question for you. For uh, what happened to Salt and, and his family during the war? Uh, he emigrated to uh, Zurich, uh, and he spent the war uh, there under considerable financial hardship. Um, his books were, were banned. He was, he was uh, very profligate, so when he made money, he spent it. And there were times when he made pretty good money, but he always spent it. So he had you know, virtually no savings. And uh, he managed to, to, to get out. Uh, he stayed in Austria. He was devoted to Austria, didn't want to leave, like you know, Freud um, was helped by aristocratic connections late in the day. Got out, 
and uh, took a couple of trips to California, considered uh, relocating to California as a lot of Viennese emigres did, um, but felt more comfortable in Switzerland, partly because of the, land, the landscape. He was really very committed to the forest, and they didn't have that in California in the way that he, you know, the kind of forest that he, that he liked. There are a couple of people on that side with hands up if somebody with a mic can get over to them. Uh, I was just wondering if Disney was aware of the uh, Zionist roots of the book and the, um, the idea of Jewish persecution when he t turned it into a film. Um, probably not. Uh, or uh, It's hard to say. Disney, you know, was not known for being a, a great friend of the Jews. Um, and he really, uh, he, he, uh, makes the story into a more straightforwardly anti-hunting story. Um, the animals have this kind of idyllic existence, which, which takes some of the, 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 the Jewish persecution feel away from it. Uh, even though uh, in the, the book as well, the humans, the, the, the question of integration has to do with animals and humans living together. At the beginning, the animals are already kind of embattled and the weather is harsh and you know, you kind of, you, you can think of them easily as, as bedraggled Eastern Jews, you know, uh, joyous at times, but also living in significant hardship. Whereas in the film, the situation is, is very idyllic early on and then it's rudely interrupted by the, uh, uh, the, the, the hunters. Um, and so it has, it, it doesn't have that, that, uh, that kind of feel. Um, Disney was very, he was very committed to this, uh, to this story and he spent a long time working on it. He tried also to make it as a, a live action nature film and that didn't work out. And then uh, they went through many uh, different ideas uh, for the animation, and uh, he he sat on it and sat on it, and uh, it, it cost him a lot of money. It wasn't a commercial success right away. The war was going on. People were, you know, uh, I mean, this didn't that didn't always. Some of the films that came out during the war were commercially successful, but this one also there were hunters groups that protested against the film. The, the gun groups pro that protested against the film. It was fairly. Uh, controversial. It wasn't immediately embraced as this great American cultural phenomenon that it's become. And then eventually that, that, that happened and there were sp spin-off films and lots of books based on the film, not on the book anymore. It was all, all credited but in very small print and so it's easy to think that uh, Disney uh, was the creator of Bambi as most people do. Hi, my question is this. Um, since everything old seems to be new again and anti-Semitism is virulent throughout the world, um, your experience on campus, is there any equating between the condition today and uh, what Bambi seemed to demonstrate? Um, and what do you think Salton's attitude would be with the way the presence is right now. I mean, Herzl's dream is reality. Israel exists. Uh, apparently, nothing really has changed. Is there any dialogue on campus relating to this? Um, my particular campus or campuses generally? Yeah, yeah. I teach at Ohio State um, and uh, there's a fairly prominent Jewish studies program there and a large Hillel. Um, and there hasn't really been much uh, that I've seen in, in, in the way of uh, anti-Jewish sentiment on campus. You know, occasionally I teach a Holocaust literature and film class and uh, occasionally I I get uh, students, uh, you know, who seem to know a lot about the different Nazi uniforms and the kinds of weapons that they carried and um, ask questions about Hitler as a military strategist and don't you think he was underappreciated as a general? And, um, 
but uh, I, uh, you know, I, Ohio State has not had the kind of uh, fraughtness that, that Columbia or Irvine or other, other places around the country uh, have experienced. Um, Salton, you know, uh, as I said, uh, to, to his credit, uh, he was very alive to the, the dangers of anti-Semitism and he was alone among these. And one of the things I think that's sort of important about him is that uh, to all appearances, he looks like a highly assimilated uh, Jewish intellectual. He changed his name. His name used to be Zaltzman. Um, he changed it to, Z to Zalton. Uh, uh, he, he liked playing with his name and he had other names that he wrote under as well. Um, uh, and in this Rakoff piece, for example, uh, I don't, you know, I feel slightly awkward saying this about Rakoff because uh, and I guess I criticize dead people all the time, um, <laughs> so I shouldn't be so bashful about it, but uh, he, uh, you know, he, he misses the Zionist thing completely. He basically assumes, perhaps having looked at an image of Zalton, that this is a highly assimilated Jewish intellectual who didn't have much of a connection to Judaism. And he says that there's a certain Jewish uncertainty in the book. But he, Zalton shows that you could have, as your friends, mostly highly assimilated people who were skeptical of Zionism, like Schnitzler and Hofmannsthal, and be yourself actually kind of a committed Zionist. Um, and so I think that, sure, you know, what he, uh, where he saw anti-Semitic violence in the world uh, today, he would be, uh, he would be outspoken in his uh, denunciation of it, as he was, uh, as he was in his own, his own day. We're under time constraint that we need to honor, so it is time for one final question. Yeah, uh, I just want to. Um, ask you are, are you the first person who's really like uh, making it well known that the connection between this tale and uh, the Jewish roots of it or is it's the first time I'm hearing about this but I'd just like to know are other people talking about this or knowing about this and then the other thing I wanted to just tell you is a few blocks from here there were two deer <laughs> that that wandered um, just about two or three days ago into the neighborhood. And they were not um, uh, received, they were, they were not assimilated. <laughs> in, in fact, um, they, they weren't tolerated at all. Oh. And, uh, and one of them was killed. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, and so, and that was just a few days ago. Was it? Yeah. It was deer, it was Bambi and his uh, uh, lady friend. Yeah. Was the deer put put down, or yeah. well, they were they were distressed to uh, to that effect. Yeah. It was Halloween night, and they all of a sudden appeared in what it was referred to as the Gold Coast neighborhood. They made all the newscasts in that block. Huh. And the outcome was not, the outcome was not good. Yeah, for the deer. Yeah, that's sad. Um, <laughs> Synchronicity that you've come to yeah, tell us yeah, about the deer. Wow, um, I you know I uh, the, I might take this this uh, opportunity to to add one thing um, about the the deer and the Jews and you know it's Kafka who played more with animals that had some kind of association with Jews and this I think is why. Uh, his stories, he's also gotten a lot more attention from, from critics. One of the reasons why his stories have been read, uh, tended to be read as allegories of Jewish experience, where Zalton's hasn't. I mean, another reason is that Kafka's famous story about the, uh, uh, the talking ape, Red Peter, um, first appeared in a Zionist publication, Martin Buber's journal, The Jew. So, you know, when a story about a talking ape who's having trouble assimilating into human society comes out in a journal called The Jew, it's, it doesn't feel like that much of a stretch. Zalton's uh, uh, Bambi appeared in a very different kind of publication, uh, the Vienna's version of the New York Times, um, uh, a paper that had actually kind of assimilationist commitments. Herzl worked for uh, the, this newspaper, the Neue Freie Presse, and uh, his 
bosses of the Neue Freie Presse were not happy about his Zionist activities. And they uh, told him, you know, you can never mention this stuff uh, in your writings for the Neue Freie Presse. That may help explain why people have been slow to, to read uh, Bambi in the context of Zionism. There is one essay by a Germanist, not coincidentally somebody who's worked a lot on Kafka, uh, about the Zionism, um, the Zionist echoes in Bambi, this Iris Bruce woman. Um, uh, and what she does is point to some broad connections, basically, some of the language, uh, the verb persecution, suggestive, also that theme of per persecution and the critique of assimilation. Um, what I'm trying to do is suggest that the Zionist echoes in Bambi are more precise and more specific to Zalton's particular Zionist commitments, this cultural Zionism, and that this can actually be used to help explain some, some of the stuff in the novel that's otherwise hard to explain, like, like this moment where Bambi hears the song of the elk and has this kind of experience of transcendence. Um, so it's not totally original. Some of it is original. Um, it's really hard to understand why more of this hasn't been done. I mean, it's such a, a you know a culturally important book, and that that's something that I'm I'm interested in investigating. Um, you know, academics like to say that everybody's missed this, and now I'm going to come along and point it out. Um, and so you know, it, 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 and they sometimes are just lying. Um, other people haven't missed this. You know the, um, you're just claiming that they missed this. And you're acting as though what you're saying is original. And in order to make this, they've missed this claim sound really persuasive. You know, you have to have some explanation as to why people have missed this. Why have they missed it? Come up with a, a narrative. I'm, and so I'm working on that part of it. I want to try to explain why people have missed this. With, I think... Anyway. Uh... I think we agree in the question. I think the questioners, I think, demonstrated too that what we're dealing with is a familiar narrative, even iconic, seeing it in, in a very fresh way, something that's been categorized maybe just for children that is far more than that. But we've also learned and gained, I think, insights into Jewish thought and Jewish life, Jewish culture at a particular time and place. So I think we're all in the Professor Writer's debt, and thank him very much. Thank you.